All right, so chapter 13, part two, the age of kings. So the age of kings, the decline of feudalism, the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation and the commercial revolution all served to enrich European society, which we talked about, raise their standard of living. And this greatly increased the power of European monarchs, your hereditary rulers. So here's uh, some different, uh, different absolute monarchs of the time. And really the main causes were uh, the, the church is going to lose its power after the Reformation, the split in the church. Uh, great wealth from the colonies allowed uh, these monarchs to amass huge amounts of money. And they now had their, their own standing armies. They didn't have to worry about, uh, didn't really have to worry about the nobles bringing knights and things like that anymore. And all this uh, leads to rulers with complete total power. Uh, some of your different monarchs that were absolute rulers, George III of England, Louis XVI of France, and Catherine the Great of Russia. So the growth of royal power. So in the Middle Ages, the power kings had been limited by the nobles, by the parliaments in, in England, and the Catholic Church. In the 16th and 17th centuries, this began to change. Kings were now able to, to increase their power for a variety of reasons. Wars on religion. During the Reformation, most kings took control of religion within their own borders. In England, Henry VIII made himself the head of the national church as early as 1534. The religious wars that followed the Reformation provided, provided kings with an opportunity to build large standing armies, to introduce new government officials, bureaucrats, to increase taxes, to increase taxes and the army was used to put down the resistance and anyone who uh, you know tried to revolt against the taxes. And here, of course, are some of uh, Henry VIII's wives. Some were beheaded, some died on their own, some survived. Uh, and, uh, of course, a couple were divorced. So changing roles of nobility. In the Middle Ages, nobles had been an independent source of power. Many, many even had their own castles and armies. In the 1600s, rulers like Louis XIV tamed the nobility. Louis built a magnificent palace at Versailles where the nobility were forced to live by his side and under his watchful eye. So nobles kept, uh, kept their wealth and privileges but were expected to obey the king's commands. The growing middle class in town frequently allied themselves with the kings uh, and against uh, the nobility. So the rise of absolute monarchs. So during the, the Middle Ages, European uh, kings were not as powerful as what they're getting ready to become uh, because the feudal lords had real had all the real power because they're the ones who actually controlled the local manners. And they're the ones who, who had the loyalty of the knights. The Catholic Church was also dominant religion in Europe. So the kings did not have as much power as the church. And really the Pope kind of had uh, power over all the peasants because he was... Uh, uh, really in control of their souls. So a new justification for royal power. So now these guys are going to gain all this power. Now they have to kind of justify why, why they're going to get this power. So new theories arose to justify royal authority. Many rulers adopted the Renaissance view, justifying their actions as basis of reason of state. An Englishman, Thomas Hobbes, wrote that man was not naturally good. Without a strong central authority to keep order, life would be nasty, brutish, and short. Society would break down into a war of every man against every man. Hobbes said kings were justified in seizing power because they, uh, really, they were the only ones that could act impartially and maintain order in society. Other monarchs like James I of England, Louis XIV in France, justified their power on the basis of divine right. According to this theory, the king was God's deputy on earth and royal commandments express God's wishes. So anything a king said was coming from God. And you can start to see, uh, you know, pretty much divine paintings of kings at that time, halos and things like that. So a study in absolutism. So absolutism refers to a monarch's total control over his subjects. Louis XIV of France provided a model for other absolute monarchs. His will was law. Any critic who challenged the king was punished. Louis uh, interfered in economic and religious lives of his subjects. 
his regulations established standards for all French industries. He demanded that Protestants convert to Catholicism or leave France. Leading nobles were forced to spend most of their years residing in the king, with the king in his palace, so they had no opportunity to disobey or rebel. Louis developed a large army with standardized uniform training and housing. He involved his nation in a series of wars to expand France's frontiers and bring glory to his rule. Although he probably never said, I am the state, this expression accurately summarizes his view of royal power. In the end, Louis's aggressive actions served to unite Europe against France, leaving his country bankrupt and exhausted at his death. Absolutism in Russia. So on the eastern end of Europe, the rules of Russia adopted a system of royal absolutism on a grand scale, so even bigger than everyone else. By the end of the 15th century, the rulers, the rulers of the region around Moscow declared independence from the, Mo from the Mongols, finally. Next, they set out to increase Muscovy, which was really the territory that they controlled, size by conquering pretty much everyone around them. The bulk of Russia's population were serfs. And of course, a serf is a peasant who were required by law to stay on the land and work with their work for their nobles uh, as land uh, landowners. Just when serfdom was pretty much ending in the, the rest of Western Europe, or in, really in Europe, it was increasing in Eastern Europe. In return for their powers over their serfs, the Russian nobility uh, pledged absolute loyalty to the Tsar. So the nobles needed the Tsar to crush any of the rebellions by the serfs. Uh, so they pretty much gave most of their power to the Russian Tsars. So Peter the Great. Peter turned Russia from a backward nation into a modern power by introducing Western, Western ideas, culture, and technology. He went on a voyage to the West, working in shipyards in Holland and visiting England. In Russia, he executed his mutinous palace guards and developed a new army in, along Western lines. He used force to make the old Russian nobles shave their beards and wear Western style clothing instead of traditional Russian garb, which you see here in this picture. He defeated the neighboring he defeated the he defeated neighboring Sweden and Turkey, greatly extending Russians boundaries Russia's boundaries. He took control of the church, imported foreign workers, and opened new schools. Peter moved the capital of Russia from Moscow to St. Petersburg, the modern uh, a modern city. He ordered to be built on the Baltic coast so that Russia would have a window to the west. So really, he's trying to copy as much of the Western ideas that he possibly can. He even moves the capital closer to the rest of, England, of uh, Europe. Catherine the Great. So 40 years after Peter's death, Catherine II continued Peter's policy of expansion and westernization. She also promoted limited reform at the beginning of her reign corresponded with leading French thinkers. So the things that she did, she actually started to get ideas from the French thinkers. She knew what enlightenment was. Uh, and she even gave uh, nobles their own charter of rights. So she, she gave certain groups their rights, but she uh, didn't give it to the serfs. However, she refused to part with any of her absolute power. So during her reign, the conditions of Russia's serfs actually worsened. She defeated the Ottoman Empire, expanded Russia's border to the Black Sea, and carved up Poland with her neighbors. So what you see here is she knew uh, what rights need to be given to uh, nations and people, uh, but she refused to give up her power. Uh, so she's going to give some of the nobles rights, but she's not going to give any of the serfs any rights. <clears throat> 